The League of Women Voters Troy area is happy to welcome you to this candidates forum. I am Karen Fabian, Voter Service Chairperson for the League and tonight's moderator. This forum affords you the opportunity to meet the candidates whose names will appear on the November 7th ballot running for a four-year term on the Troy City Council. You are asked to vote for three. The governing body of Troy is the City Council, and it is made up of seven members. The mayor, mayor pro tem, and council members are represented through vote equal, sorry, equal voting powers. The responsibility of a city council member generally involves determining city government and administration policies, as well as adopting budgets and legislation. As many of you know, the League of Women Voters is a national, nonpartisan organization which welcomes all persons of voting age as members. The League of Women Voters does not oppose or support any candidate or political party. It does take action in the public interest on particular issues after careful study and consideration by members. The League emphasizes the importance of individuals working together to achieve good government responsive to the needs of all persons. The candidates tonight are Teresa Brooks, Herrick Chanda, Ann Erickson Galt, Mark Gunn, Dale Murish, and Edward Ross. Edward Kempen is also running, but he is not with us this evening. You will also be voting for the mayoral position. Mr. Ethan Baker is running unopposed. The format for this candidate's forum has been established by the League of Women Voters Troy area. Each candidate will make an opening statement of two minutes. The timer, Pam Brady, will signal with cards the time frame. At the end of the allotted time, the camera will pull to a long shot and the microphone will be turned off. We will begin this evening with Ms. Brooks. Thank you and good evening. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this wonderful forum. My name is Teresa Brooks and I am currently serving on City Council since 2019. I am a physician, a small business owner, and a mother of three wonderful children who attend the Troy Public Schools. I love living in Troy and I love raising my family in Troy. I also enjoy giving back to my community, which is why I'm currently serving on the Employee Retirement Board, the Volunteer Firefighters Incentive Plan Board, the Retiree Healthcare Benefits Board, and the Board of the Stage Nature Center. I am proud of the work that we have been able to collectively accomplish over the last four years. We have been able to successfully navigate through a global pandemic. Our library is now fully funded and it is open seven days a week. Public safety is a priority to the citizens of Troy and City Council has also made it a priority. We have, we have invested more money year over year into our public safety officials. We have created an ethics ordinance to hold our elected officials to the highest moral and ethical standards. And we have invested and expanded our beautiful parks and trails. We have been able to accomplish all of this in a fiscally responsible way while maintaining our AAA bond rating. I look forward to continuing the progress that we have made serving as a United City Council and Mayor, and to continue listening and responding to our residents' needs. Thank you. Mr. Chanda. I want to thank the League of Women Voters and the audience present here today. My name is Hirak Chanda, and my story is your story. My wife and I moved to Troy 24 years ago, and like many of you, we choose Troy because of its diversity, 
its record on public safety and the schools. I am an engineer and inventor of 11 United States patents. My son was born in Troy, went to Troy's public schools. I have been a passionate community activist, tutored hundreds of students and currently serve on Troy's Historic District Commission. Troy is a city I dearly love and very proud to call my home. In the Council, I will ensure that Troy maintains its stellar record on public safety, provide adequate funding for our police, EMS and the Voluntary Fire Department. I am going to grow our sustainability initiatives, maintain green spaces and invest in our parks and recreational facilities. I'll focus on making sure that Troy remains an attractive destination for businesses of all sizes. As an engineer, I understand how important it is to govern based on logic and data and not on emotion or anger. If elected, I'll make history by becoming the first Indian American to serve on the council of a city which has been a preferred destination of immigrants from all over the world. Try the city of innovation, inclusion, and optimism. We are the microcosm of this great nation. I want to lead this city so that we remain a safe and welcoming place for everyone. November 7th, I ask, humbly ask for your support. I ask for your vote. Thank you. Ms. Gold. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and to all of you watching because you care about Troy. I'm Ann Erickson Galt. I've lived in Troy for 19 years with my husband, a GM analyst, and my daughter, an Athens grad. I've an, I'm an attorney. I have an office right here in Troy. And since 2019, I have served on your city council. I'm running because I believe Troy's on the right track, and I want to make sure it stays a safe and welcoming community for everyone. I've spoken to hundreds of residents, business owners, community leaders who tell me they're content with the direction of Troy of course, we have problems, all cities do, but the residents, the city, the businesses, we're doing well. And one of the reasons we're doing well is because we have an ethical collaborative council. I know firsthand the importance of an ethical and cooperated body of elected officials. In 2016, I fought for transparency regarding our former city manager, uh, his wrongdoing at a time when other people on council wanted to sweep it under the rug. We cannot take our ethical, harmonious council for granted. And because our council works well, we've accomplished much. We've enacted a strong ethics ordinance. We fully funded our library. We've increased our investment in our police and public safety. And best of all, we've done all this while managing uh, to balance our budget and maintain our AAA bond rating. Troy is safer and more livable than most cities and was recently ranked one of the top 10 places in the United States to live. And there's more to come. Increasing our environmental sustainability, upgrading our recreational facilities, including building a world-class cricket field, and amending our master plan to protect our neighborhoods. But we cannot achieve these goals if we return to an era of division and conflict. I'm running to keep Troy on track and I humbly ask you to re-elect me, Ann erickson Golf for Troy City Council. Mr. Gunn. Good evening, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this. Thank you to the citizens. Thank you to the, the citizens that have also attended uh, publicly. Um, I'm a longtime resident of Troy. I've been here for 38 years. I've uh, owned a business in Troy for 37 years. I have uh, served on my homeowner association for 12 years. I've been, uh, I serve in the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Um, I've been a big brother, big sister, and I've also volunteered in an organization called Crossroads where we assist in um, homeless people, helping them not with just food and shelter, but also to help them get jobs. I, I've lived in Troy, as I said, 38 years, and it's been an incredible uh, experience watching the city grow. I do think we've got some, uh, we're going the wrong direction on some, on some issues. I'm well aware that we have lost several police officers in this city. Uh, we've lost several firefighters. Um, I'm also aware that I've been contacted by several people as I'm, I'm also a citizen activist myself. And I have heard that a lot of times decisions are made without always calling the citizens in to get their input. Not every time, but quite a few times. So my approach would be that I would always bring the community together. 
I would, uh, you know, when there's decisions being made for new development, I think that before any communication goes out that uh, the citizens who are going to be impacted have the opportunity to express their, what, how it could impact them. But I also would look to bridge businesses and citizens together. I'm well aware that there are some <coughs> citizens affected by the activity of certain businesses. So I would try to bridge the gaps. Uh, as a city councilman, I'd focus on the following strategies. I would create an open dialogue and communication. I would establish lines of communication between business owners, community members, and the city council. I would, hold, I would uh, I guess, request that we have regular town hall meetings. And Mark Gunn, I look forward to your vote. Thank you. Mr. Murish. Hi, I'm Dale Murish. And my goal is to bring a unique, independent perspective to the council, representing all stakeholders in Troy, residents, firefighters, police, and city employees, regardless of political views or citizenship, including business owners and those who work in Troy but live elsewhere. Sustainable development. Troy has very little undeveloped land. We want to have developments that fit in with the nearby neighbors, ideally that they are happy with. We don't want new five-story apartment buildings overlooking backyard swimming pools. We may need changes in zoning laws to remedy this. The 20-acre development proposed at a recent, recent council meeting had over 140 single-family dwellings. It might meet the current zoning laws, but that cries out for changes to not put 500 people on a postage stamp. New housing developments could leave most of the backyards forested for the wildlife. We can encourage apartments and condos to have curbside recycling. Maintenance costs in city buildings could benefit from using large rolls of toilet paper like many businesses already have. Automatic faucets, too, where we don't already have them. Fiscal restraint. Fisk Troy already has good fiscal discipline. I will propose a 1% inflation-adjusted budget cut each year for five years. Each department could look for creative ways to economize. We could use the savings for the Firefighters Incentives Fund or a property tax cut. We need to remember we're spending other people's money. Keep Troy family friendly. Let other towns have mar marijuana dispensaries. Treat government like a business, partner with schools, and promote energy inf energy efficiency and recycling. There's more at dealmourish.com. I pledge to work harmoniously with the other council members and mayor. Different ideas do not have to be divisive. Mr. Ross. <coughs> Thank you. I'm running for city council out of a profound sense of duty to my community. Our city faces both critical challenges and remarkable opportunities in the coming years. And I believe that my background and experiences make me the best candidate to represent the interests and aspirations of Troy residents. I lived in Troy since 2012. I have a computer science degree from Wayne State and an MBA from the International University of Monaco. I'm a software engineer by trade, and since 2019, I've been a Troy volunteer firefighter. One key motivation um, behind my candidacy is a prevailing sentiment among our residents that their concerns often fall on deaf ears in the City Council. This feeling is one that I share and I aim to address comprehensively. I believe the decisions made by the City Council should be grounded in robust community engagement and feedback. One example was the Site 11 ballpark proposal. It's my vision to ensure that decisions of such magnitude are made with a broader spectrum of community input, fostering transparency and accountability. My professional background as a software engineer has given me a unique problem-solving approach to address complex issues. I've honed the ability to break down huge challenges into manageable components and systematically assemble solutions. This approach is ingrained in my professional practice and will be instrumental into addressing the issues facing our city. My experiences living and working and studying in diverse international settings from France to Egypt to Afghanistan have prepared me to navigate and appreciate Troy's cultural diversity. Our city is a mosaic of cultures, and I understand the importance of embracing and respecting these differences. I'm not a politician. I harbor no aspirations for higher political office. I am, at the core, just a neighbor living on Gulliver, driven by a sense that everyone in Troy needs to be content and heard. My ultimate goal is to foster an environment of trust and collaboration between city council and our community. I envision a city where residents have faith in their council as their ally, that work tirelessly for their best interests, and even when those interests don't align with every individual's preferences, I want our... Thank you. Candidates will now be answering questions submitted by constituents through the email, letters, phone messages, and here 
our audience members. Questions submitted are pertinent to the issues facing the current situation and future direction of the City of Troy. Members of the League have screened the questions for duplication and appropriateness. All candidates will be given one minute to respond. I reserve the right to close discussion of one question and to go on to the next. I will begin the question period with our first question, which is, what would you like to see happen to the site of the former Kmart headquarters after the building is demolished? Mr. Chanda. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm actually very excited to see that the site is getting redeveloped. It's sitting there for almost 20 years. First thing I want to mention that this is a private property, so as a city we'll have limited say in what can be done. But this is, right now, is going to be a mixed usage development. So what I personally would like to see is entertainment complex and uh, restaurants and then maybe some residential on the top. But we need to get input from the community and I'm sure the property owners are going to do their market research to find out what is appropriate for that. This is the same owner who owns the Somerset Mall, so I'm assuming they're going to do something, a skywalk to the Somerset Mall and, um, and then um, something that will be commercially viable but also good for the city. I would like to also see some walking trails and green spaces surrounding that. Ms. Galt. Thank you. Um, I think this is wonderful progress. Uh, one of the questions that I've gotten repeatedly over the last four years is, what's happening with the Kmart property? I wish I had a nickel for every time somebody asked me that question. And now I can finally say, we're moving forward. Uh, but more precisely, it is the Forbes co company that's moving forward. And I'd like to thank Nate Forbes and his family company for, for making this progress. Um, I, it's my understanding they've wanted to do something for a while and I'm glad that you know the stars have aligned for them to be able to do that. So I don't have a set notion of what I'd like to see happen there, but what I would like to see is some robust community engagement. Um, I'm hoping that the Forbes company will uh, take part in that. I understand that a previous developer did that as well and the community really appreciated it. Um, it I would note that the current zoning if I understood correctly, is a PUD, so it may come in front of council. So, thank you. Mr. Gunn. Yes, I, I would be very interested in the, uh, the property to be somewhat of a, um, I guess like an open air type mall, something similar that they have in, uh, in Frankenmuth. Um, but I think what would be really creative is if we have such a diverse, um, diverse popu population here that we would be and have you know, maybe there would be, you know, Asian uh, stores, there'd be you know, Indian, Indian, there might even be an American Indian store, you know. I mean, there could be many things that could bring the community together and let us learn about each other's <coughs> culture. Um, I'm also been working with uh, VFW, and we are going to try and approach Mr. Forbes about possibly giving us a, a site that we could move the VFW there um, into a corner somewhere in the property. But I think there's a lot of opportunities, but I really like the idea of bringing all of our cultures together into a community that we could learn about each other's culture. Mr. Mersh. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that it would be good to have input from the community, as others have said. Um, this is a very big project um, that should, if anything, see the community input before it's proposed as a uh, as a proposal. So I, I would like to see that. And, uh... Mr. Ross. As uh, several people have noted, this is a privately owned um, piece of property. Um, I think that a lot of us were caught off guard um, that it's actually going forward. Like Ann said, if she had a nickel for every time she heard what we're doing with that. Um, so in that regard, I'd like to see what the community would like to see there and then figure out a way um, for that to be translated into some kind of policy or some kind of incentive um, to make that happen. Ms. Brooks. 
Um, as it has been stated, um, this is a private property um, and thus it is not owned by the city. Um, but it is an exciting proposal. Um, we're excited to see what, is, what will happen um, in this unique space. Um, this is a place that is located, this is property that is located on our Big Beaver Corridor, which is our downtown that is centrally located. So I would really love to see something that will be a gathering space for our community and a place that brings forth a sense of community. Um, and so, as Anne has mentioned, it, this is something that may come before council. If it is, in fact, a PUD, um, we may have some input as far as um, our recommendations. But I really hope that the developer does engage the residents and puts forth something that we can all celebrate and be excited for. But this is exciting news for our whole city. It's very exciting. Should Troy develop a plan to enhance sustainability in the city? If so, how should it move forward? Ms. Gold. Wonderful question. Um, sustainability is one of the things that I want to see the city work on in the coming year. And in fact, we've already begun that process. We recently had a study session in which we talked about how we would go about creating a sustainability plan for Troy. Uh, we are on track, we've applied for and are on track, we hope to receive a significant grant, uh, community block grant from the county. And that grant money would allow us to do a lot of things. Uh, one of that's been proposed is to hire a consultant to help us develop this plan. Uh, but again, I think the most important thing, and I'm gonna sound like a broken record tonight, is public engagement. We need to hear from our citizens what they want to see happen with sustainability, what's important to them, what they're willing to invest in. And that's where I'm going to be guided is what our citizens, what our businesses, what our community leaders tell us that they want to see happen. Mr. Gunn. Yes, I would agree with the, uh, the idea of bringing the citizens forward and getting their ideas as what is important to them for sustainability. Um, you know, there's numerous different things that we can do, but I guess if there's a study being done already, it'd be wise to look at that and get their input. Um, too often, you know, some of these things that we're considering doing move forward without any engagement, and I've been a big proponent that we bring all the citizens in who want to give their input and let's hear what they believe should be done. So that's, that's how I would support it. Mr. Murish. There was a recent meeting where the sustainability was discussed and there were quite a few people, volunteers, would be able to volunteer for a, a commission on that. Um, so I, I think that that's good to bring them in and, and uh, get their input. Uh, we want to make sure we don't spend too much money on it though, because uh, a lot of times sustainability means uh, adding extra cost to projects. Mr. Ross. You know, one of the coolest things about knocking on thousands of doors is that you get to meet some really interesting people. Um, and so I knocked on a gentleman's door and he asked me what I thought about sustainability. Um, I gave an answer and then asked him what he thought about it. And I got the 25 minutes of the most incredible um, detailed, you know, what sustainability really means. Um, and he was talking about, I don't wanna give out too many details, but I mean, he was giving out you know, things that we're doing with plants and grasses and trees and different types of things like that. And I remember telling him, regardless if I win this election, the, the city needs this person to be on a committee, um, you know, a commission of citizens. Um, his knowledge um, was rather incredible. Um, he was charismatic. Um, he could definitely carry a room. I think um, if we go down that road, we'll be all right. Ms. Brooks. There is a strong economic argument for the city to support sustainable practices. And I would first like to acknowledge um, what our city has been doing. We are a member of the Michigan Green Communities Network. We also recently had a study session, as Ann mentioned, earlier this month, and we will be applying for a block grant at the end of the year. We plan to utilize these funds to create a strong sustainability plan. And we would also likely hire a consultant to help guide us through this process. We have created an internal uh, sustainability committee. Um, and as we work uh, towards developing a comprehensive sustainability plan, 
our fo focus is also looking at um, resiliency and things such as um, EV infrastructure. Uh, we will continue to explore additional funding opportunities such as grants and we'll work with our, our municipal neighbors as well as the county to bring sustainable practices to our city. Mr. Chanda. Yes, I, I also attended the same, uh, same forum, the study session, and I applaud the city for getting or applying for that community block grant. Um, we are trying to, we are going to form a sustainability committee, and it is important that we move forward. Community engagement is ex extremely important because we have a lot of expertise within Troy who are very passionate about this issue and they want to help and it can come from different sectors. We also get to get feedback from the businesses. Um, it's, and that with the grant we're going to make a, a, hire some consultants from outside, but it's also important that we have our internal people from Troy residents who will be part of the sustainability committee. So all suggestions are important and in long term we would like to move forward with sustainability initiatives. We had several questions submitted on this topic. Please c clarify your stance on marijuana dispensaries in Troy. Mr. Gunn. I would actually suggest if I'm elected that we adjust the um, city charter and that cannabis dispensaries would be um, banned. That would be my decision. Mr. Murish. I would agree with that. Do anything we can to keep them out. Mr. Ross. Yeah, um, so I drive through Sterling Heights quite often uh, to play hockey. Um, I've driven by dozens of dispensaries. Um, I've seen what it's done to streets like Van Dyke, Mound, things like that. Um, I would, well, no one should go to jail, obviously, for using marijuana. Um, I think that the dispensary should stay out of the city of Troy. I think that that's what the people want. We haven't, they, you know, the proposal didn't even make it on the ballot this time, um, despite, you know, paid efforts of larger companies. So I'd continue that. Ms. Brooks. I would like to be very clear. The city of Troy is an opt-out city. We do not allow marijuana dispensaries in our city. Um, it is not something that anybody has an appetite for. It is not something we are planning to initiate. And so I just want to be very clear that we do not have marijuana dispensaries in our city and there are no plans for that to happen. Mr. Chanda. I agree with Dr. Brooks. We do not have marijuana dispensaries in Troy and we don't plan to have it in the future. So I do not support if a proposal like that will come in the future. I do agree with medical marijuana, which is important, but for recreational purpose, I do not support that. Ms. Galt. As Teresa said, we are an opt-out city. There are no dispensaries in Troy. There's no current plans to bring dispensaries to Troy. Some of you may have seen petition signature gatherers uh, this summer who were misleading people into believing that they would be creating a charter amendment that would ban uh, or somehow limit dispensaries? Well, we already have them limited to zero, and we want to keep it that way. Um, I would agree uh, with Mr. Chanda that medical marijuana has its place, and we do allow a, a limited number of medical marijuana growers within the city. Uh, so it's working fine just as it is. There's no need to change it. Troy is well known for its excellent public facilities, such as its library system and parks. What have you done to support the amenities that countless Troy families enjoy, and how would you support them as a council member? Mr. Murish. Um, I've been, uh, uh, been a patron of the library, and, and I enjoy uh, getting books and, and DVDs there, and so I believe it's very important to have that there. We had a bitter political battle over this several years ago where the library was shut down for a time and then uh, so it's like one group of people wanted to have a Cadillac library and the others were happy with the Chevy library and, and uh, 
so anyway, we finally got this resolved. So uh, uh, I would I would do my best to support the library and the Parks and Rec. Mr. Ross. Thank you. We shouldn't obviously ever be cutting funding to the libraries and the parks. Um, part of the reason that we have so much money to give to these amenities and establishments is because we're saving money on our volunteer fire department. Um, so in that regard, we need to do whatever we can to set policies in place so that funding can stay at the level they are and increase as time goes on. Um, the cricket field that's um, coming in is going to be a huge boon um, for participation in the parks. Um, and we've talked about public-private partnerships. While Site 11 wasn't ideal um, for that ballpark, um, there is a location somewhere in the city where things like that can be explored and so that money um, for these things doesn't have to come directly out of our pockets. It can come from uh, pri Ms. Brooks. One thing that I have seen, especially since COVID, is a strong interest from our community in outdoor activities and community spaces. We have um, engaged in robust citizen engagement to determine what our residents want and what they want to see in our city. There has definitely been an interest in activities such as the cricket field, and thanks to our representative, McDonald, we will be bringing in an, a cricket field to our city, which is exciting. We will also be, we, are also, we also broke ground recently for our pavilion and ice skating rink, amenity, I should say, um, Jean's, at the Gene Stein Park. Um, on city council, we have also fully funded our library, and it is now open seven days a week, as I stated in my introduction. So these are all exciting things, and I believe these are all things that our residents want to see. And we will continue to listen to our residents moving forward. Mr. Chanda. I'm a big patron of the library. My son, who was born here, I remember taking him to the library, to the kids section. And since then, I've always been there every week. Um, the parks and recreation facilities is what makes Troy what it is today. We are. We are a community which values our parks. Um, I live next to Bulan Park and pretty much every week we go there for walking. The cricket field is going to be a big boon. That's something going to, going to add to the value of our city. And I'm, I'm going to do everything to support those recreational facilities and the parks. Ms. Galt. Our library is a treasured institution in our city. And I'm very grateful to the voters in 2020 for approving uh, the library millage, which allows us to fully fund our library. Uh, we're hopeful that we're going to do some renovations and expansion. We're working right now on a plan to do that. Um, we have been investing in our parks and recreation, and I'm super excited, as I mentioned earlier, about our new cricket ground. This is something our residents have been asking for for two decades. And to be able to finally come through with it, this will be very exciting. I'm also looking forward to, uh, as uh, Dr. Brooks mentioned the opening of our new pavilion and the skating amenity. This is something our, our community has asked for as well. So we need to continue to listen to our community, what they want to invest in, and we will continue to invest in those amenities. Mr. Gunn. Yeah, I'm extremely supportive of the library. I, um, we, it was a few years back where it was going to be shut down. I worked uh, to try and make sure that that didn't happen when we had budget constraints. So I'm extremely supportive of that. I also believe we have, um, out of our, we've got 18 parks. I think there's 11 that are not developed. I, and, you know, door knocking and talking to several people, there are several people thinking, you know, maybe some of the parks could still be developed. I guess that would be more of a city study. I certainly would be supportive of it if it was a you know, park that we had that needs to be developed. I also heard that there were some parks that needs a little bit more I guess a scheduled mm. observation or maintenance, finding uh, debris and whatnot. So I think I would certainly be supportive of trying to find ways that we regularly check the parks. But overall, it's been an incredible, uh, got an incredible park system, and I'm very supportive of the library as well. While Troy has long been a physically safe city, our city, state, 
and country have suffered in recent years from threats to our democratic system. What have you done to protect our democracy and civil society? Mr. Ross. So in terms of public safety, um, I've been a volunteer firefighter since 2019. Um, we've trained with the police department um, to respond to any mass casualty incident, active shooter. Um, in terms of, um, well, let's leave it at that. Ms. Brooks. I would first like to thank our city clerk, Aileen Dixon, who was voted city clerk in the state of, uh, the best city clerk in the state of Michigan, um, as well as our st city clerk, our staff in the city clerk's office for all of the work that they do to keep our elections safe and secure in the city of Troy. Um, we have been working with the county, we work with other municipalities to ensure the highest safety for our residents and so that residents feel comfortable when they are voting. Um, that they are doing so in a way that their votes are being heard and their voices are being heard. Um, so those are things that we care about in the city of Troy. Those, that's something that we take very seriously and it is something we will continue to work for moving forward. Mr. Chanda. I join Dr. Brooks to congratulate and thank our city clerk and her staff who is really doing a wonderful job. Recently, we expanded voting rights. We can vote early. Voting right is something that we all treasure, and, and we are, I want to make sure that everybody can vote safely and sound and without any hesitation that their vote will get counted. Protection of democracy is something that I deeply care about. This is where the physical safety of our, us is important, but we, our safety, if the whole society will fall apart, if if we do not have the democratic democratic system that functions very well. So I, I support the recent Prop 2, which was expanded, expanding voting rights that we can vote early. And um, you know, a try is a wonderful city where people can vote without any hesitation, without any fear that their vote won't be counted. Ms. Galt. The right to vote is critical. Uh, this is something that is the foundation of our democracy. The idea that that would come under threat disturbs me greatly, and I'm glad, as uh, Dr. Brooks mentioned, that we have uh, an excellent city clerk who works really hard to make sure that everybody in the city gets the, uh, is able to exercise their right to vote. I'm very excited about the new measures, which is going to expand access to voting. Uh, not only uh, have we had uh, no reason absentee voting for uh, several years, but now we have early voting as well, where you can just take your ballot and run it through the machine, because I know a lot of people like to do that as opposed to the absentee ballot. And you can do that for nine days before the election. And even though it's, we're not required to do it until February, our clerk is, is going to offer it for this election. So, and these things are very important to me. It's something, transparency and democracy is something I've been fighting for since long before I became a member of city council. Mr. Gunn. I'm extremely engaged and supportive of fair voting. Um, I've been a precinct delegate for 12 years. I've worked behind the scenes on election day in different polls. And, you know, to make sure that the process goes smooth, which uh, for everything I've seen, it's been very smooth. Um, you know, this is something extremely important to me that everybody has the right to vote, who's legally able to vote, and, and that it's done in a safe manner. Um, in terms of safety, we don't have a lot of, uh, uh, we have lakes in Troy, but not lakes that I would uh, monitor as a U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary, but I do offer uh, safety uh, in lakes beyond Troy. Mr. Mersh. Um, yeah, I would support stuff that makes it hard to cheat and easy to vote. Um, anytime you widen the, the, uh, the uh, voting time period, there's more possibility of cheating. So, um, and I've sat as a citizen and watched uh, the same events that all of us have, have gone, gone through, and, and uh, I. I don't agree with the civil disobedience that, that occurred. Um, 
and you know, it's everybody follow the law. I know you have all alluded to and spoken a little bit about the cricket field, but we got several questions asking about uh, funding and how it's going to be executed. So I'll use this question. Maybe you can just expand a little bit more on it. Um, do you support usage of state funding for the cricket field, and how do you see the execution of the project? Ms. Brooks. Well, the cricket field is something that is very exciting um, to be coming to our city. Um, we have a lot of residents in Troy who have been asking for this for quite some time. Um, the funding is predominantly uh, funded through the state of Michigan. It was secured money that um, our representative, um, Sharon McDonald, was able to secure. Um, and so it is, we, are we are currently looking at various sites, but considering probably the strongest is Bolin Park at this time. Um, and we, but we are still working out some of the details. It's not completely figured out, but we are working out some of the details. But it is something that is very exciting for our city, and it has been something that residents have been asking for for quite some time. So we're happy that we are able to deliver this for our residents. Mr. Chanda. I'm also very excited to see the cricket field finally happening. Residents have been asking for it for a long time. And probably the only member in the panel who actually grew up playing cricket. I <laughs> can offer some expert opinion. Bullen Park is an excellent place because uh, of the size of the field. And um, thanks to uh, and uh, thanks to Council Member Anna Erickson Galt and our um, state representative Sharon McDonald, most of the money we are, will be used to create the cricket field is coming from the state. So this is our taxpayers' money that is coming back to Troy, and it adds to the diversity that we enjoy in Troy. It's, it's, uh, we're already a very diverse city, but then about 20% of the population are from South Asian origin and they enjoy playing cricket. So, and people, I don't know if people know that it's the second most popular game in the world after soccer. So hopefully it will bring business to Troy. It will bring a lot of prospective customer or home buyers to Troy. So I'm very excited. Ms. Galt. So, I'm just beyond myself in excitement about this cricket field. I've been uh, working with people for years now to try to make this happen. Uh, funding was always an issue because it, we have a very tight budget in Troy, so we had to figure out how we would pay for this. And I'm very grateful to Representative McDonald for bringing the money back. As far as uh, I absolutely approve of state funding for it, Troy is a donor city. We send more tax money to Lansing than we typically get back, so I'm very happy to see the money coming back to us. Um, the, our South Asian community especially is going to be very excited about this. Uh, my understanding is uh, by using the location in Bolin Park, we will be able to build a field that would support national, potentially even international games. So this is going to be a real boon for the city of Troy in many ways. Mr. Gunn. Well, I'm, I'm very excited by it too. I, um, I grew up, like most of us guys, playing baseball. Um, you know, when I heard it was coming, I started to do some, you know, looking at the differences. My son, mm -hmm. who also went to college and played baseball, he, uh, he was excited to try and learn a new skill. Um, so I, I am excited by this, I, and I'm, I'm okay with the state bringing the money back. We, as we've said, we've certainly given enough money to the state, so it's nice to see some of it coming back. Mr. Murish. Um, yes, I'm, I approve of the cricket field. There's a lot of people wanted it for many years, as we've heard, and uh, so that's, go for it. Mr. Ross. So I lived and worked in Afghanistan for three years on a USAID and World Bank project. Cricket is huge in Afghanistan. Um, it's even bigger when Afghanistan plays India. And depending on the result, well, the result usually ends up in a huge celebration one way or another. Um, so when I heard about the cricket field, um, knowing also the makeup of the residents in Troy, um, this sounds awesome. Um, there's been some miscommunication, I think, on the funding. And when I tell people, you know, the money is coming from state. In other words, it's not directly out of our pockets. So if Michigan was going to pay for a cricket field, what better city to build it than in Troy? It's going to bring in tons of business. It's going to be good for the community. This is going to be a lot of fun. 
My question for the city council candidates is this. Is Troy truly the city of tomorrow today when we appear to be not taking aggressive steps to make, I'm sorry, to meet the present, let alone the future? Can we stand by our city motto when we are not directly acting on initiatives such as EV charging stations for residents and visitors to the city? And this is sort of a second question part of it. Uh, proposals, supporting proposals for developing a walkable downtown commercial center. So first let's take the EV stations. Do you support putting in EV stations for residents and cities in parking lots for our wonderful parks and municipal buildings? Mr. Chanda. Yes, I support. The, most of the questions asked is where is the funding going to come from? And my response to that is there is a lot of funding available at, from the state and federal government. So I propose that we as a city um, try to tap into those fundings. Those are our taxpayers' money that needs to come back just like the cricket field. And also there are private enterprises like Tesla is going to potentially putting some high-speed chargers in different parts of Metro Detroit. So if we want to remain a leader in this area, we would like to invite people to invest in Troy and, and build up charging stations so that the businesses feel like coming here. So to answer your question, yes, I do support. Ms. Galt. As someone who drives an EV, I definitely in support of having more EV charging infrastructure. Uh, by the way, Troy has EV charging stations. We have about 45, according to my calculation. Um, most of those are on private property, but they are open to the public. Those are public EV charging stations where anybody can charge their EV. I would like to see the city move ahead with having more EV charging. Um, again, it's always going to be about funding and also location, because there's a lot of infrastructure considerations that go into deciding where you put an EV charging station. So um, I, I would like to see that happen. I'm hoping maybe the Inflation Reduction Act will provide some grant money. Um, and uh, also, people should know that the Inflation Reduction Act will allow you to get tax credits and other incentives to be able to put an EV charger in your home so that you, too, can en enjoy driving an EV. Mr. Gunn. I'm very, very much in favor of this. I actually worked uh, through an engineering company on projects in California installing um, electric vehicle, um, you know, charging stations. And the reality is the city doesn't have to necessarily put all this money into them. You have to think of it just like a gas pump. So when these gas stations, it was gas, you know, it's going to be a while before there's a change, but the reality is the, the owners are going to want these charging stations, so you pull in and you still go in the store and clean the store. So they will be investing a lot of their own money as well as expecting the city to do anything like this. So I think it's very doable. It's going to happen. Um, I've seen it in California, so I don't think the city has to worry about putting in too much money into this. Mr. Murish. Um, I would prefer to see this done as when it makes economic sense, and that that's you know, how much federal money do you get versus whatever. Um, I, I don't, well, I, I would just like to see everything done and give them a fair shake. There's been electric vehicles around for many years now, and so I think we want to, 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 uh, to, to, to go with the, um, let, let the data decide. Does it make sense to do this economically? And and for, for if private companies want to do that in their parking lot, that'd be great. If it'll, uh, Meyer has some in, in their parking lot now. So I, on city property, I guess I'd, I'd not want to give up the regular parking spots for those. Mr. Ross. The private companies installing charges, one thing, I think we can get creative here. Um, I think that parking lots and parks are a good spot for charging. It doesn't have to be free. Not all of the city's 
um, income comes from property taxes. We can come up with interesting ideas of even just having um, EVs available at parks to charge your car. One in, I worked at GM for several years. One of the most frustrating things is trying to find an EV charging spot. So if we place them in places that make sense, where residents would want to spend time while their car charges or while they, while they wait in line, um, I think there's quite a bit of opportunity to explore that. Ms. Brooks. Thank you. Um, Troy, as Ann stated, Troy does have EV charging stations. I was informed that Troy has more EV charging stations than any other city in Oakland County. Um, with that being said, of course we want to try to expand and do more. Um, the question does always come in, the funding. There's always that question about where do we find the funds to implement this infrastructure. Um, something that can be considered would be encouraging developers to integrate it into new development because that is always easier um, to do that when it's integrated into new development as opposed to trying to do it after the fact. Um, but that is always a consideration. We will, the city will always continue to explore various options as to how we can continue to, um, uh, <laughs> just, um, that we can continue to uh, fund these, uh, these, uh, in, these engagements and, and how we can continue to move forward as a city. Thank you. So the second part of this question was, do you support proposals for developing a walkable downtown commercial area city center? Ms. Galt. So one of the problems that we have in Troy for having a, a downtown is Troy didn't develop like a lot of cities did with a traditional downtown. We were a township and we uh, overnight, almost literally, became a city. Uh, we never had a designated downtown. A lot of people think of the Big Beaver Corridor as a downtown, but um, if you've driven past it or even tried to walk down it, it feels more like a freeway. So um, trying to develop a, a walkable downtown, let's begin with where do we put it? Um, I know one of the things I'm looking forward to is we are going to be doing some major renovations to the Big Beaver Corridor. I'm hoping that will make it at least somewhat more walkable. Uh, we also need to look at what's known as placemaking. Where can we find places in the city where we can create a downtown type of atmosphere without having one central location? So I'm hoping that we'll be able to look at more of that. Mr. Gunn. I, I believe possibly that could be where the, what could be developed in the uh, Kmart corridor, the mm -hmm. Kmart location, depending on what Mr. Forbes chooses. But I've seen, uh, I've seen numerous small little mm -hmm. downtown areas we actually almost have one up in the Rochester Hills there at uh, Adams by Oakland University. It's kind of that, that downtown feeling where there's retail stores and shops, but you can easily walk, you know, in that area. Uh, they have them in Grand Rapids. The, that would be what I would, that would be my vision. Now, it's his property, of course, and he's going to uh, do what he wants. But, um, you know, that's, I would like to see what happens there before we talk about recreating and spending money and changing our, our landscape for the downtown area. Mr. Murish. Yeah, I would agree with Mark that uh, we want to have, have the sustainable walking the space. Um, I think tr Troy is laid out with the mile roads and that makes it very convenient to get around with cars and, and, and each individual store has its parking. So I I, I guess I don't see that happening um, to have a walkable uh, other than for like certain other places like um, maybe at, at um, maybe certain of the neighborhood nodes could be made a walkable downtown area sort of, but I, I don't see it happening without a lot of big care up to the existing infrastructure. Mr. Ross. Yeah, so Troy is a big city. We have 34 square miles. The question is, where are we going to put this walkable downtown? Um, Ann mentioned that Big Beaver seems like a freeway. She's not wrong. Um, I don't know how anyone would find peace walking up and down there. It's definitely not a small town feel. 
Um, knocking on doors of people in the city, everybody has their own place where they'd like to see a downtown, which corresponds usually to where they live. Um, so <laughs> there's that. Um, another thing though, we have sidewalks that don't go anywhere in a lot of places. If you try to ride a, your bicycle down Rochester, for example, the sidewalk will abruptly end. You'll have to then cross the road where it starts up again. And then if you're lucky, you can make it down to the next corner before it start, you know, before that one ends. So I think we would probably need some kind of comprehensive plan or ideas for pass. Um, down John R between Long Lake and South Boulevard a few years ago. Um, oh, sorry, wrong color. Ms. Brooks. So as Jan stated, the Big Beaver Corridor is considered our downtown for our city. The Downtown Development Authority is re-landscaping this area. And we are trying to make it more walkable by creating some barriers, as well as trying to incorporate placemaking. Placemaking are areas where individuals can gather. Um, I believe that by having the Jean Stein Pavilion and ice skating um, amenity, uh, this will also serve as a gathering space for our residents and a place where people can have a sense of community. Um, as much as we can make a walkable downtown, I believe that that is something that we will continue to strive to do. Obviously, the way our city is currently laid out, it is not comparable or the same as all other cities. But we will have a unique style, and we will have a feel that is like our city, our city of Troy. Mr. Chanda. Yeah, I agree with that. The downtown, the Big Beaver Corridor is wonderful. I mean, the plants we have is, uh, is going to be fantastic, but that is not a walkable area for sure. It is. It feels like a freeway, as someone mentioned. So we will try to make it more walkable, but I agree with Mark, and my vision is also that the Kmart property that we are developing, that could become, depending on how the property owner decides um, that could become a downtown because that is very close to the Somerset um, Mall, which is a treasure for our city. So um, that would be my vision of making that area a walkable downtown if Mr. Forbes and his company develops or wants to develop it that way. What will you do in your capacity as a city council member to make Troy inclusive and welcoming for everyone. Mr. Gunn. Well, as I described, and I, I don't know exactly where this could go. If this, this, I, I had this vision of having an area of Troy where all of our cultures come together and we're able to share, um, share it with each other and learn about each other. I think when you come to understand and when you come to learn about um, you know, different cultures, there's more of a uh, understanding with, and maybe not this division that sometimes happens. Uh, where this could be located, I don't have the answer for that. If I, you know, had a little time to maybe hear what the community thought of it, I would, I would certainly uh, listen to that, but I would, that would be my, that's my goal, is to try and create an area where all these <coughs> cultures come together and we, we learn from each other. Mr. Mirish. Um, we have, I believe we have uh, laws in place for inclusivity, and so they, they just need to be obeyed, and uh, people be kind to each other as a regular uh, way of doing business. And uh, I think that things have improved over what they were, and things will continue to improve as we get better at, at uh, adjusting to it. Mr. Ross. So one of the key things of inclusivity is meeting people. So I can't tell you how many doors I've knocked on, um, with people I've argued with online. Um, and I have a sign in their yard now. Um, we've exchanged ideas. Um, and, and when you meet someone in person, um, it's hard to not get along. So the, when I was at the University of Monaco, they had a a program called Peace Through Sport. It was a master's level program. Um, and they would go through and um, in war-torn countries, things like that, and build partnerships like that. So, you know, some ideas would be 
um, local outdoor basketball tournaments or something where you can get citizens involved in areas where they live without having necessarily to go to a central community center, something like that. So, Ms. Brooks. So Troy is one of the most diverse cities in Michigan and our diversity is our strength. We are also a welcoming community. The diversity of our city is one of the many reasons why I moved my family to Troy. Troy also supports our Global Advisory Committee, which is an advisory committee that incorporates uh, individuals from all ethnic backgrounds. I had the privilege to attend the Troy Days International Day and was so proud of all the beautiful diversity that was on display. So I look forward to continuing to engage and collaborate with our residents, and I am so proud of all the diversity that we celebrate in our city of Troy. Mr. Chanda. Troy is not, it's probably the most diverse city in Michigan, and it is, it's not just the ethnic diversity, but it's also socioeconomic diversity. We are, we have immigrants from almost 70 different countries in Troy, calling Troy their home. So I, I am also very proud of the Global Troy Initiative that we, we have right now. Um, so I attended that uh, Troy Days Festival where the celebration of different cultures, they came together. I would propose more of these happening, like we celebrate some of the Diwali, for example, Chinese New Year, Eid, Eid and all the other celebration of this stuff, maybe recognize these holidays. And then we might have a place where people can come together and celebrate their culture. Maybe do that thing that Global Tri is doing on Tri Days, do it one more time somewhere else. So we are an inclusive society. We are very proud of that heritage, and I think we will continue with that. Ms. Galt. I'm glad Harak mentioned uh, the various other holidays that are celebrated by many of the diverse people in our community. Um, I would like to give a shout out to the interfaith group in Troy that have been working on these issues for quite a few years now. Uh, they've been trying to bring us together to, to not just to tolerate each other, but to embrace each other in, in, a, in a real spirit of pluralism so that we, we fully understand and, and, and get to know one another. Um, I think uh, the cricket field is a good example of us moving forward with uh, understanding the needs of various members of our community. I'm excited that our library is going to get a bookmobile so that we can start taking the library to people. Uh, we often forget that being inclusive also uh, means looking at people who are differently abled and not able to get around. And I would like to see a lot more people from diverse backgrounds on our boards and commissions in the city. We have seen a worrying increase in anti-LGBT rhetoric and actions in Detroit metro area over the past couple of years. How will you ensure that LGBT people feel welcomed and respected in Troy. Mr. Mersh. I was not aware of that. Um, I, I would try to treat everyone equally and uh, do what I can to make sure that they feel welcome. Mr. Ross. So within schools, um, with anti-bullying campaigns, things like that, we should strictly state, you know, enforce those. Um, we should do more community events and outreach so that we meet more of our neighbors. Um, it's very difficult to hate somebody if you talk to them. And so um, the more that we can do those th types of things, that can go away. I don't think that in any way um, Troy's ever um, advertised itself as a non-inclusive um, place to be. Um, we had issues with previous city councils and comments and the citizens took swift action and, and dealt with that. So, and I expect that would continue. Ms. Brooks. I think it, that it is very important that we make everyone feel welcome in this community. I know that our library does a lot of programming to be very inclusive, um, including in June, we celebrate LGBTQ. I, um, in the library 
and they do promote that on social media. And I believe that we, as a city, we try to really incorporate and include everybody. I do think that it would be wonderful to see even more diversity, as Anne had stated, on some of our boards and commissions to make sure that everyone knows that they are welcome in our city. Um, we continue to strive to be the best community that we can be and really include everybody. And I also agree that just having a strong sense of community and really getting to know our neighbors is really important. And, that, and that's a, a really strong way to just really feel that you get to know each other and that um, everyone can feel a part of the community. Mr. Chanda. Part of the reason I love Troy so much is because we are a safe and welcoming city. So part of being welcoming is also welcoming sexual orientation, difference in sexual orientation. One of the things I learned during campaigning as I knocked doors that I you get to know people and get to understand where they're coming from. So Troy is doing a wonderful job. The current administration and the mayor and the city council, I believe, is doing a wonderful job making sure that residents feel welcome irrespective of their sexual orientation or or any other ethnicity. It's part of being a diverse society is not just ethnic diversity or socioeconomic diversity. Sexual orientation does play a role in that. So I will do everything I can to make sure that tradition continues. Ms. Galt. I think this ties in very much to the previous question. Uh, how do we make Troy an inclusive and welcoming community? Uh, I have a family member who identifies with the LGBTQ community and uh, I'm told that uh, they have personally experienced bullying in the schools. Uh, obviously, and city council, there's very little we can do to control the school environment, but we can certainly set an example and let it be known that bullying on the basis of your LGBTQ status is unacceptable and we won't tolerate it. I've especially been disturbed uh, in recent past to see attempts to ban books or other such things because they tend to be geared at uh, LGBTQ themed materials. And I can't help but feel that that has a lot to do with why people want to ban those books. So I would also love to see Troy have a pride celebration. I think that would be something that would uh, be, create a welcoming atmosphere. Mr. Gunn. I would agree with Dale and Ed in that completely respect mm. everybody in the city, regardless of their you know, ethnicity mm. or their sexual orientation. Mm. Um, I too have somebody in my family that has, you know, is part of that community and, you know, when you hear them talk about what they've gone through in that mm -hmm. process, it's, um, it can be pretty, pretty emotional. It's, it's, uh, it's not an easy lifestyle. Um, I would just be completely respectful mm -hmm. and, and try and make sure that anybody that supports me or is a part of my team that they're respectful as well. Have you heard of 15-minute cities, and do you see this approach in Troy's future? Mr. Ross. I don't know what a 15-minute city is. Okay. Uh, Ms. Brooks? I'm actually not sure either. Okay. Does anyone have an answer to what it... I'm not supportive of 15-minute cities. Can, can you explain it? Yeah, it's, well, from everything that I have read and learned, it's pretty much um, more or less trying to create a city where um, everything is right there and there's not really as much of a need to travel outside of that circle of, of the city. And, you know, the, the especially, my gosh, our state, we have so many incredible uh, opportunities to travel. And... I, I would not be supportive of a 15-minute city. Does anybody want to add to the answer now that we know what 15-minute means? No? Okay. Oh, go ahead, yes, please. I, I would be inclined. I agree with Mark that, that, uh, that this idea that everything's 15-minute city where you're getting maybe more grocery stores, smaller sh shops opening up to be within a certain area. So if population density, and I think in Troy we enjoy having our uh, suburban 
a little more space per person, and, and, and it might be a 15-minute city might work for Royal Oak or some place like that, or downtown Detroit has, has things like that, but I don't think it would fit uh, Troy very well without a lot of, um, a lot of, I, I think you, you want to have it be uh, so that they could, um, uh, I, I lost the three thought, sorry. Thank you. This will be our last question. What personal or professional experiences qualify you to govern as a, a city as diverse as Troy? What will you do in your, oh, I'm sorry, I already asked you that one. I guess the question is, what makes you a particularly good candidate to be on the Troy City Council? Mr. Ross. So I've lived overseas for seven years, three or four different countries. I've gone to school in Europe where we had 26 students um, with 20 different countries represented. Um, I've lived and worked with all kinds of different people from all different backgrounds um, of every imaginable category. Um, the one thing that I cannot stand are when people feel like they don't have a voice um, or if someone's not listening to them or taking their concerns as seriously as they ought to. Um, so with that regard, um, I would want to represent every single person, make sure everybody's voice is heard. We've seen that um, in various things that we've reached out with um, in the past year here, gain voices heard, and I would hope that it would continue. Ms. Brooks. So I am currently serving on city council for the past four years since 2019. Um, I am a physician, um, and as a physician, I am held to the highest moral and ethical standards. And the first rule of medicine is to do no harm, and that is something that I carry with me. I have carried with me for the past four years, and I will continue to carry that with me as I move forward. I am a mother of three children who reside in the Troy Public School District. So I understand our community very well. Um, I love living in Troy. And I would also just like to thank, once again, the League of Women Voters for inviting me to this forum this evening. And I humbly seek your ongoing support for the next four years. And I look forward to seeing everyone and greeting everyone while I knock doors. And to find out more about me, you can visit me at my website at www.brooksfortroy.com. And I continue to um, enjoy serving for Troy, and I look forward to the next four years. Thank you. Mr. Chanda. I'm an engineer and a strong problem, problem solver. I am an inventor of 11 US patents, and I think I can, my analytical skills and problem solving techniques and, think, and have the ability to think outside the box. I have a deep connection with the community here. I have tutored hundreds of students, and I know a large segment of Troy population. I think I can bring people together. As an engineer, I have worked with cross-functional teams from various parts of the world and diff different functions. So I also like to ask Troy voters for their support and their vote in this coming election. Ms. Gull. I think the number one thing is experience. Uh, these four years on council have provided me with a wealth of knowledge of how the city functions. I've met a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. I have had the opportunity to hear from the residents, businesses, community leaders, what are their needs? What do they want to see Troy do or, or not do? And I believe that that experience and knowledge makes me uniquely prepared to go forward with another four years on council. Um, I have demonstrated my ability to work with everyone on council. We have frequently disagreed on things, but we're seldom disagreeable. Uh, we work together well as a team, and I believe that should continue. Um, I, so I humbly ask for your vote 
for me and Erickson Galt for Troy City Council. Mr. Gunn. I've been a business owner in Troy for 37 years. I've overseen multi-million dollar budgets. I'm very familiar with the complex issues that can arise and I'm a problem solver. I've also been a consultant to cities on zoning and ordinances. Uh, I've been a real estate broker for 30 years, so I'm very familiar with a lot of different development regarding real estate. Most importantly is I am someone that will listen to you, the citizens. You know, I've listened to you as I've worked the city, you know, docking, knocking doors and talking to people. And I'm someone that if you bring a problem to me, I'm not going to push it aside and let the experts just handle it. I'll stay on top of it. But more importantly, I'll try and come up with solutions that are amenable to everybody instead of just, you know, sometimes they just let go. And I've, I've heard from too many people. And that with me and if you elect me city councilman, that will not happen. Thank you. Mark Gunn. Mr. Mersh. Um, I'm a retired GM engineer, so I have uh, full time available to work on this pro new, new project of being on city council. I have uh, um, a few numerous patents and patent applications as well. And uh, regarding how to treat people, I, I'm an Eagle Scout and I still maintain the seven or twelve scout laws, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, kind, courteous, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Um, and I've also been on a couple bike trips to Europe in the summertime, and I was able to cycle behind the Iron Curtain and see how those people live. And uh, I, it makes me realize that socialism does not work. The League of Women Voters Troy area would like to thank the candidates for their participation. Voters may find more information about the candidates on the November 7th general election ballot by going to the League's um, website. Vote411.org is a nonpartisan site that gives information about candidates and proposals. We also have a voter's guide that can be picked up um, at various places in the city, like the library. Um, this forum will be rebroadcast on the CMN cable channel, and you can see, you can view it at cmntv.org. Again, we'd like to thank you for participating, and please remember to vote on November 7th. Thank you.